The piano can be a truly haunting instrument, in more ways than you might expect. Allow yourself to be transported by me, the incredible being scared, and Mew on piano. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. When I was 14, my mother fell in love with classical music. It started with Tchaikovsky, playing from her portable Walkman to her blasting bark in the kitchen CD player. I never cared for the music, but I knew how much she loved it. So I always made it seem like I was just as interested in classical music as she was. Every morning I woke up to the sound of classical music and the smell of bacon. When I walked into the kitchen, I would see my mother dancing while she cooked my breakfast. Those were one of the few moments I would truly share the same love my mother had for classical music. There was something about the soft music playing in the background, while stuffing my mouth with my mother's extra greasy pancakes and butter toast that I loved so much. I never found a problem with my mother's passion, until four men lugged a piano into our living room. My mother bought out three beginner piano books from her purse, and I knew that I was screwed. She already knew how to play the piano pretty well, and the only person that would need these books was me. Once the men left, she tapped on the piano bench, so I reluctantly walked up and sat down. From then on, my mother started to teach me how to play the piano. I never wanted to play any type of instrument, so I decided to act like I was completely unteachable. Whenever she told me how to play a certain note, I would always purposefully hit the next key over. When I sensed that she was getting upset, I would plant my face into my hands and complain about how difficult it was for me. No matter what I did, she would still make me sit on that piano bench with her for two hours a day. We would continuously practice the same song, over and over, until she lost her patience. This was now a part of my schedule and I was about to just start actually trying. Two months later, I was coming back home after school. I had decided that today was the day I would start trying to learn how to play the piano. When I got home, I found a random sedan in our driveway. When I walked into the door, I saw a very uninterested woman sitting on our couch. She had short black hair, and looked to be in her mid-thirties, and had a permanent scowl on her face. The woman looked up at me, and tried her best to produce a smile, only to show me the best example of what a fake smile should look like. I took a seat beside my mother on the piano bench, and smiled back at the woman. She told me her name was Miss Wilson and she was my new piano tutor. She lived four houses down from us, and expected me to be at her house at 5pm on the dot, every Monday and Friday. Once the woman left around an hour later, my mother explained to me that she was tired of feeling like she was being a drawback on my passion for music. So she looked for a local piano tutor who we would be able to afford. The lady down the street contacted her yesterday, telling me she would be able to teach me for $30 a week. Once my mother heard that she used to perform for our town symphony 10 years ago, she automatically accepted the offer. Three days later, I went up to Mrs. Wilson's house and knocked on the door. When she opened the door, I did a very visible double take. She looked completely different. Mrs. Wilson was smiling a genuine smile, and wearing a simple red skirt. She looked like she was 15 years younger 
than what she was. And when she greeted me with a hug, I felt a feeling of unease take over my body. When she hugged me, I knew for a fact that her hand grazed my butt. But I figured it was an accident. She grabbed my right shoulder and guided me to her piano. It was in her living room, but it was placed at an awkward angle. The piano keys were facing the couch, and the piano bench was right on the wall. When I took my seat, I noticed my back was right on the wall, and I was facing the couch. Mrs. Wilson took her seat on the couch, and told me to take up my piano book and play the song I've been having difficulty with. I tried my very hardest and played the whole song with only two mistakes. I only made those mistakes because I noticed that every page I played perfectly, Mrs. Wilson's legs would start shaking up and down harder and harder. But when I made my first mistake, I noticed that she would stop shaking her leg and start staring at me intently. Once I finished the song, she walked up to me and stared down at me. She started to stroke my forehead with her index and middle finger. In the softest voice I've ever heard, she said, You're a bloody failure. I looked up at her and asked her what she said. But when I blinked, my eyes noticed she was back on her couch giving me a slow clap. She told me I only messed up twice, and that with only a little bit of practice, I could have this song down perfectly. After the lesson, I went back home and told my mother what I thought she said. With a chuckle, my mother told me I was probably hearing her wrong, and asked me to play the song we worked on. I played the song without a mistake, and saw a huge smile spread across my mother's face. I knew that learning how to play the piano was a great gift for her. So I continued to go to Mrs. Wilson's house twice a week for my lessons. That Monday, she sat on the bench with me while I practiced a new song. Every page I played right, she would stroke my thighs. And with every wrong note, I would feel a sharp pain in my leg. I knew she was pinching me but I really wanted her to stop rubbing me. After my lesson, I played the new song I learnt for my mother, and she was even happier with the results. I wanted to stop learning how to play the piano from Miss Wilson, so I decided that from now on, after my lessons, I would butcher the songs that my mother asked me to play after each lesson. When the next Monday came, Mrs. Wilson opened the door before I knocked. She was wearing a short black skirt and told me to come in for the lesson. I went inside and took my seat on the bench. She took her seat on the couch and watched me as I played. This time I played the new song without a single mistake. I closed my eyes whilst I played, as I had memorised the song, and only opened them once I'd finished. I heard the sound of Mrs. Wilson's voice saying, Bravo, excellent, perfection. I looked at her, only to find that she had taken her shirt and bra off to reveal her rib bones poking out of her midsection. Her chest was now a mixture of mashed up flesh and crushed up bones around her slowly beating heart. With every clap, her face started to fall apart more and more. Her nose slid down her chin, and her eyes have started to melt out of the socket. This skin on her cheeks started to peel off, only to reveal rotting flesh underneath. That's when I bolted out the bench and ran out of her door. And ran out of her door. I didn't stop running until I got to the front door of my house. I used my key to open the door, but the door wouldn't budge. After about 30 seconds of frantically knocking on the door, a man answered the door with a confused look on his face. I screamed at him, Who the hell are you? Where is my mother? With a surprised look on his face, the man took out his cell phone and called the police, 
while going into our laundry room. I caught a couple of sentences, but I couldn't hear everything. Missing kid, four years ago. I do not see his mother. He's very confused. I don't know. Maybe around 18 to 20. Today has been three days since I ran out of Mrs. Wilson's house. Mrs. Wilson was found dead in her house. They say she'd been dead for the past two years. She died of a heart attack, and I have been missing for the past four years. My mother disappeared the same day I did. I was found, but my mother is still missing. While everyone was getting drunk and laid, I was at my parents' house suburban home, studying for the MCATs. My parents spent their whole lives working high-paying jobs, and as a result, were able to afford a three-story mansion and fill it with lavish art deco and furniture. Recently, my father decided to even buy a $15,000 grand piano just because it looked cool. I had moved out of state five years before and had to stay in this scarcely furnished guest room on the third floor at the end of the hallway. It was 7 p.m. and the sun was beginning to set. My parents were attending the annual Rotary Club auction and soon headed out. I resorted back to my books and continued studying. I just finished reading the chapter about nucleus mitosis and glanced at the digital clock by the bed. It was 9 p.m., and it was pitch black outside, and everywhere else in the house. I roll my chair over to the door and glance down the hallway. It was too dark to see anything. Realizing I had been studying for the past six hours, I decided to call it a night, and collapsed on the bed. I was about to fuck the shit out of Megan Fox, until I awoke to the sound of a door slam coming from downstairs. I looked at the clock and saw that it was only 10 p.m. My parents are probably home, I thought to myself. I fell asleep again. I was awoken soon after to another sound. This time, however, it was Mozart's Lacrimosa playing from the grand piano downstairs. Is my dad seriously practicing right now? I thought. I had to admit though, he was playing very well. I pulled the blanket over my head and tried to fall back asleep, but something was wrong. No one played piano in my family. My dad just bought the piano to piss my mom off. The piano continued to play. I had a sudden urge to go check downstairs and see what's going on, but realizing I was frozen with fear kept me from doing so. Instead, I reached for the home phone and called my dad's cell phone. He answered. Hello? Dad? What's up? Where are you guys? We're on the ferry right now. The piano playing came to an abrupt stop. I remained silent. My heart was skipping beats. Ryan? My voice was shaking. Yeah, Dad? Who's on the other line? The piano stool screeched against the marble floor. Dad, there's someone in the house. I heard something heavy sprint up the stairs and down the hallway. I jumped off the bed and slammed the door to my room and pushed my body up against it. My dad's voice was yelling over the phone demanding me to hang up and call the police. I felt something slam against the door from the outside, and I heard heavy breathing. After about ten seconds, everything was silent. From the other side of the door, I heard a man's voice calmly say something that sent chills down my neck. My wife was a doctor once. She never had time. She never had time for me. The footsteps slowly walked away from my door, and I heard the front door shut. I was scared stiff and decided not to move from my spot against the door. It felt like hours before my parents and the police showed up. The police fully searched the house and discovered that the downstairs piano door had had its locks removed 
and were lying outside the door, severely rusted from years of exposure from the elements. The next day, I traded in my medical books and changed my major to civil engineering. I am a musician, not one of grave importance, or even outstanding ability, but still, I consider myself a musician. I can play with the best of them, and I know my way around an instrument or two. More importantly, I am a collector, a collector of various items ranging from the odd to the obscure. There is no rhyme or reason to my collection. It consists of anything that piques my interest, that I can get my hands on. That is why, when I saw an advert on Craigslist for a vintage, rustic, red piano, I couldn't help but reach out to the seller. The ad seemed title normal enough. Old piano, free to a good home. I'd seen countless ads like this before. It was nothing out of the ordinary, and certainly nothing that would grab my attention. Still, I felt the need to click on it. Perhaps I was bored. Or perhaps I liked the idea of not having to pay for a potential addition to my collection. Either way, I gave in to the compulsion. Upon clicking on the ad, I was greeted with an anomalous and intriguing story. It read something like this. I am offering my piano to anyone who is willing to come and pick it up. It is very old but still playable. I can prove this upon your arrival. It is red and bears no brand markings. This is because it was made by my great, great grandfather. This instrument is one of a kind. He went out himself and chopped down a redwood tree to provide the wood and build it. It took him many days to finally cut down the tree and much, much longer to finish making the piano. Nearly his entire life was put into this thing. I, however, have no use for it. It has been passed down in my family many times, and I have no wish to continue the tradition. And the piano is currently taking up too much space in my home. I want it gone as quickly as possible. My name is Margaret, and you can reach me by my phone number, listed below. Serious inquiries only. Reading the ad sparked my curiosity. One of a kind? Redwood? How strange and absurd. I had to see this thing, if it was half as remarkable as Margaret's description made it out to be. Then it was a must-have for my ever-growing collection. As such, I decided to give her a call. Margaret answered the phone after the first ring and immediately asked if this was pertaining to the piano. Although I found this to be an odd greeting, I assured her that it was indeed why I had called. She seemed rather enthused, and I shared her enthusiasm, happy to know that the piano was still available. We set up a time, the following day, when I could go over and have a look at it. I hung up the phone excited and bewildered. I had a feeling this piano could very well be the centerpiece of my oddities. My collection spans many eras of history, as well as numerous countries. They range anywhere from the mundane to the wildly strange. But all of them are nothing, if not great conversation pieces. Some of my favourites include a genuine voodoo doll from Louisiana, a tooth from a saber-toothed cat, a book of spells written 
by an alleged witch and a piece of an antler from the world's largest moose. Being a musician, I also own countless instruments, too many to name. Each time I acquired a new item, my heart would race with excitement, with whatever it was I was receiving becoming the focus of my attention. The piano was no exception, and I could not wait to see it in person. I woke up the following day with no resilience to my alarm. I was more than eager to start my day and head off towards a potential new addition for my collection. I swiftly went about my daily routine in an effort to minimize the time between me and Margaret. She did say that she was an early bird and that I could swing by whenever. With this in mind, I showered, brushed my teeth and got dressed and ate breakfast at a record pace, making it out the door roughly 25 minutes after waking up. It might sound a bit silly to be this worked up over a material object, but to that, I'd say you must not be a collector. This piano was my mission, and it was one I intended to see through until the end. I found myself at Margaret's house while it was still morning, as she was just two towns over from where I lived. It was a quaint village at the end of a dead-end road, surrounded by shrubbery and woods. I noticed an old tire swing in the backyard, indicating that it may have been the house she lived in as a child. Maybe her parents passed away and left her the house. Maybe the piano reminded her of them, and that was the real reason she was getting rid of it. My speculation was interrupted by a woman who came running out of the cottage to greet me. She signalled for me to come inside and went back in herself. This was no doubt Margaret. I never told her which car I'd be in, but I assumed not many people came out their way to the middle of nowhere and parked in front of your house. I got out of my car and made my way up the stone walkway to the front door. I entered the house. Margaret seemed overjoyed to see me. It was something adjacent to a relative seeing you for the first time in a great while. It was odd but refreshing, and it certainly made things less awkward. We exchanged a few pleasantries before she rushed me over into the other room that contained the piano. I could tell that she was excited to show me, just as excited as I was to actually see it. I matched her pace as we made our way to the room. Upon entering the room, I stopped dead in my tracks. There, just a few yards away was the piano, in all of its glory. It was a beautiful concoction of wood and ivory, the likes of which I'd never seen. It had such a striking red colour, giving it an illustrious and bold finish. And the design? It was magnificent. Simple yet magnificent. Highly original. And certainly one of a kind like Margaret had said in her advert. I stood there in awe with my mouth open. Margaret must have thought I didn't like it because she quickly started going off on a sales pitch about its charm and history. She then went to sit down at the stool in front of it, and placed her hands over the keys. I tuned it yesterday, after your call. Let's hear how it sounds. Margaret began playing a beautiful piece. Not only did she play, but she also sang as well. This is when I took my attention away from the piano and allowed myself to notice her. She was a young woman, maybe in her late twenties, very beautiful, very slender. She had silver highlights in her hair, giving it a strange, albeit lovely luster. Her singing voice, accompanied by the wonderfully rich tone of the piano, 
captivated me, in a way that I cannot describe. It surprised me to know that she not only played, but could also tune the piano. Her ad made it seem like she wasn't musically inclined at all. I allowed myself to be taken by the song until she finished. Before I could compliment Margaret on her playing, she quickly began talking, continuing her well-rehearsed sales pitch. I don't know if it was her playing or her voice, but I was sold the minute she touched the keys. Because of this, I interrupted her. I'll take it. She seemed astounded when I said this. Really? You will? Wonderful. We were both happy, and everything seemed fine. But one fact kept creeping and crawling in the back of my mind. I wasn't sold on the piano's backstory just yet, so I decided to ask her about it. Keep in mind that Margaret and I live in the Midwest. So, you've lived in this house your whole life? I asked, secretly fishing for information. Oh yes, as did my parents. The house is very old, older than the piano. And your great-great-grandfather, he lived here as well? I kept bombarding her with questions. Yes, he did. Well, redwoods only grow in California. So your great-great-grandfather travelled all the way there to chop down a tree and make a piano and brought it all the way back here. It was at this point that Margaret realised I'd caught her in a lie. She apologised to me and explained the truth behind the piano. It would seem that her great-great-grandfather actually did go out and chop down a red tree to make this piano, just like she said. But it was not a redwood. It happened to be a tree that was located near where we both lived deep, deep in a nearby forest. Being an avid historian, Margaret's great-great-grandfather had known about this tree for a while. It was a local legend of sorts, and it had always been his dream to find it. Locals deemed it the blood tree. It was a sacred tree worshipped by the Native American tribe many years ago. Anyone who finds the tree is said to live a long life filled with luck and prosperity. Those who vandalise it, however, will forever live a life of fear and misfortune. Her great-great-grandfather, of course, fell into the latter category. Though she claimed to not believe in the legend, she did point out that he died of a heart attack shortly after finishing the piano. Margaret's story was wild and entertaining. Even so, I believed her. It seemed that her ancestor finally found the tree he'd been searching for and wanted to take a piece of it home as a trophy. A piano was a fitting choice, seeing as this seemed to be a family of musicians. As for the curse, I was not concerned one bit. Perhaps Margaret was scared despite her disbelief, and that's why she wanted to give me the piano. Either way, I'm a skeptic at heart, so it's a win-win situation in my eyes. I gladly accepted the gift, dark past or not. Despite Margaret's lie and the piano being free, I attempted to offer her money. She wouldn't have it. She insisted on me just taking the thing off her hands. That would have been fine, but just taking such a beautiful instrument from someone would not have sat well with me. It wasn't much, but I slipped an envelope containing $100 into her mailbox on the way out. After calling over a friend to help me lift the heavy piano into the bed of my trunk, I took off from Margaret's house with my Lou collectible. I made it home with ease, and with the help of that same friend, 
I positioned the piano in a lovely spot in my living room. I had a new piece for my collection, and I was happy. All was right with the world, or so I thought. For a few days, my life continues as it normally did. My routine remained unchanged. The only difference was the new piece of furniture in my house. The new centerpiece of my lovely collection of strange objects. After a while, I barely noticed it was there. Despite its beauty, it blended in with the rest of my home, much like the other items in my collection. On the third night, after receiving the piano, however, something weird happened. Something most certainly out of the ordinary. I had just laid down to sleep and placed myself in a comfortable position on my bed. As soon as my eyes were shut, I started drifting into a light sleep. I had been exhausted from a long day at work. To my dismay, a loud bang coming from downstairs jolted me awake. I jumped up out of my bed and took a moment to process the sound. I realised quickly that it sounded like the piano's full board slamming shut over the keys. That could easily happen on its own, had I left it open. But I hadn't played the piano even once since I procured it. How could the full board slam shut if it was never opened to begin with? I raced downstairs in an effort to satisfy my curiosity and put my mind at ease. What I found did neither. Upon walking over to the piano, I noticed that the foreboard was up. Not only did it not slam shut over the keys, but it somehow opened on its own? No way. There was no way that was even possible. I discarded the nonsense that was swimming around in my overtly tired mind and chalked up the sound being that of one of my neighbours. I also must have opened the foreboard when moving the piano and never closed it. That was the only other explanation. I closed the foreboard over the keys and went back upstairs to bed. I ended up sleeping for the rest of the night. The next day was pretty normal for me. I woke up early, took a shower, brushed my teeth and ate breakfast, and I went to work and dealt with the stress that came along with it, just as I always did. The piano was the furthest thing from my mind, and it wasn't until I got home that day that it made its way back in. I opened the door to my house, and immediately felt a cold gust rush from within. This was strange, as I did not leave the air conditioning on, and it wasn't a particularly eventful day, as far as weather goes. Brushing this off, I walked into the living room and set my jacket on the couch. I then looked up and noticed the piano. The full board. It was up. That couldn't be. I knew that I closed it the night before when I was getting up to inspect the strange sound. This got me thinking, was someone in my home? I sped around my house at full speed with a kitchen knife in hand, ready to attack an intruder if there was one. I raced up and down the stairs, covering every inch of the house. I checked and rechecked every room, making sure I was completely alone. As it turned out, I was. Eventually, I found myself back in the living room, in front of the piano. I looked at it once more, and noticed that the foreboard was down. Was I going mad? No, no. I was just experiencing the side effects of a long day at work. Nothing more. I must have just thought the foreboard was up when I came home. That's it. 
At least that's what I told myself, to keep from dwelling on the situation. Still frazzled from the stressful day I had, I made my way to my bedroom and attempted to catch some shut-eye. I changed out of my work attire and into my nightwear, then plopped down on my warm and comfortable bed. A good end to a bad day, I thought. As luck would have it, I wouldn't be getting any sleep just yet. Quickly after shutting my eyes, I heard another sound coming from downstairs. This time, it wasn't a loud bang. No, not at all. This time, it was music. Not just any music either. It was the piano. How could this be? Was someone really in my house this time? Or could it be the piano was playing itself? Neither option sat well with me. With nothing but adrenaline to guide me, I ran downstairs at full speed to catch the culprit of these late night antics. Upon doing so, the music stopped and I watched the full board actually slammed itself shut over the keys. My heart sank, and I stood in a place at the bottom of the stairs, completely and utterly in shock. After a few more moments of being a statue, I raced back upstairs to my room and locked the door behind me. In a nervous slur of movement, I ran over to my bed and leapt on it, unable to comprehend what I'd witnessed. I sat there contemplating. All the while, a vile mix of fear and confusion brewed in the pit of my stomach. What the hell was going on? Eventually, the fear and confusion subsided, allowing melatonin to take over and do its job. I fell asleep and managed to stay that way until morning. I woke up to the sound of my alarm clock early the next day. I sat in bed for a few moments and wondered if the events from the previous night were nothing more than a dream. Now, I knew this wasn't the case, but I give in to the notion anyhow. Living in a state of denial was better than living in a world where I was going insane. I was so good at indulging in this falsehood that I actually managed to convince myself that it really was a dream, or at least the product of an overactive imagination. It was a splendid defense mechanism, and one that allowed me to go about my day without fear or unease. I left went to work, came home, and went back to bed. Everything was back to normal, just because I told myself it was. But lies only stretch so far. Eventually, the truth catches up to you, when you least expect it. As I laid there in bed, ready to sleep through the night, I heard the piano once more. I jumped out of bed rather abruptly and assessed the situation. What the hell was happening here? Was I truly going mad? If not, was this instrument really playing itself? Was there really an underlying layer of this world governed by laws of the supernatural, allowing this piano to be haunted in some way? I thought about it for a few moments as the song went on. And then it hit me. This wasn't paranormal. No, it couldn't be. This was a cheap parlor trick. Margaret created quite the jest. She outfitted this piano to play itself, much like the player pianos they had in saloons way back when. This was just a prank, a laugh at my expense. That's why the damned thing was free. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Of course, as soon as I hit the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. 
I walked over to it calmly, confident to my new theory. I opened the thing up and looked inside, begging the piano to divulge its inner workings to me. It did, but I was surprised by the results. This was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play by itself. Nothing at all. Stunned by this new realisation, I stepped back from the piano. My calm demeanour was no more. I stared at the red wood and ivory keys before me, and almost felt compelled to ask, What are you? Instead, I remained silent. The silence, however, was quickly obliterated by the sound of music, as the piano began playing by itself once again. I wanted to run, but terror kept me still. I watched as the horror unfolded in front of me. The keys were being pressed down harder than before by some unseen force. The piece was also being played at a faster tempo. And if that wasn't enough, picture frames began falling off the wall. It felt like the house was shaking, albeit slightly. A lamp in the corner then fell over bringing my attention to that side of the room. And that is when I saw it. Standing right outside of my living room window was a dark figure. I couldn't make out any features on it. The moonlight was not enough to reveal this living silhouette's identity. I gained some composure and ran back up to my bedroom. I locked the door behind me and climbed back into bed. All the while the song raged on, the house continued to shake. The dark figure, for all I know, it could have made its way into the house. Knowing this, my heart and thoughts raced at an equal rate. I was beginning to believe that I was neither crazy, nor did Margaret rig the piano to play on its own. This was something entirely different. Something not of this world. Just as I came to this realisation, the music stopped. So did the shaking. With nothing left to do, I slept. It was no easy task, but fear has to taper off at some point. It evidently did, allowing me to escape the madness of my world and enter the realm of the unconscious. I would have been grateful for this, had it not been short-lived. I awoke a few hours later to a house, filled to the brim with utter silence. Honestly, it was so silent that I immediately took notice. Normally I'd hear at least the house creaking, or even the buzz of nature from outside, but none of these sounds were present. I got up and looked out my window for a clue. The world outside my room was still. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was peculiar. Sure, it was the middle of the night. But where were the crickets chirping, the frogs croaking, the trees swaying? Where was the life outside my home? For the matter, where was the life within it? I seemed to be the only moving facet in an eerily frozen world. I hesitantly ventured downstairs for any further indication as to why everything seemed to be suspended in time. As I reached the bottom step, I looked over the piano. There was something off about it. I walked over to it and realised that a few of the keys were pressed down. I attempted to touch them, but they would not budge. In pressing the other keys, I realised that none of them would budge at all. Unsettling? Yes, but not so much compared to what I saw when I left the piano. It was so dark I almost didn't see it. 
standing completely still next to the piano, was that dark figure. When I noticed it, I jumped and let out an awkward and fearful grunt of sorts. The figure did not react. It was as if it was inanimate, along with the rest of the world. I decided to use the opportunity to my advantage. I crept over to the figure to get a better look at it. I noticed that it was wearing some sort of dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. In the face of the shroud, I saw nothing but pure darkness. I cautiously attempted to pull off the hood, but much like the piano keys, it would not budge. I stood there staring at the figure for a few more seconds, before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano started playing again, and in an instant, the world came to life. I could hear with it the sounds of my house, as well as those of the outside world. I also noticed that the figure in front of me had a swirling aura of energy surrounding it. It was a pelt of darkness, wrapped around the shadowy figure, cloak and all. Before I could even react to its appearance, the dark figure hastily reached out to grab me with a skeletal hand. I fell backwards in fear. Scrambling to get up, I managed to stand upright and make a run for it. I bolted towards the front door, rushed through it, and raced to my car. I got in, hot-wired the damn thing as my keys were inside, and took off. And from that point I was able to calm down. I had escaped, but at what cost? In a much less frightened state. I began to think more logically. Was I going to abandon my house and all of my belongings because of this spirit? Was I going to quit my job and leave town? No, of course not. Just the idea of this was preposterous. Running away was not an option. Driving in circles around my neighborhood, I weighed my options. I could go back and try to destroy the piano. No, no, bad idea. That could make the spirit angry. It might attach itself to me in the process, if it hasn't already. I could tough it out one more night, until I come up with a better course of action. Nope, I didn't like that idea either. And that's when a solid plan came to mind. One, I'm surprised I hadn't thought of earlier. I peeled out of my neighborhood, in a fury, and sped to my next destination. I was going to go back to the cellar. Surely she knew what was going on. Perhaps she could even help. At the very least, I could give her a piece of my mind for selling me a possessed piano. Either way, I would feel better. The drive was a blur. My mind was in such dire straits that I drove on autopilot the whole way there. In seemingly no time at all, I found myself smack dab in front of Margaret's house, desperate and troubled. I knew it was late, but I didn't care. I had nowhere else to go. I couldn't call the cops or tell a friend. No one would believe me. Even if they did, what could they do to help? Out of luck and out of options, I walked up the stone path to Margaret's door. Just as I was about to walk up to her door and knock, something happened. My march was impeded. The dark figure from my house appeared directly in front of me, keeping me from reaching Margaret's door. I backed up a bit, confused and frightened, but the figure did not follow. I ran back to my car to make a getaway, but the figure remained at Margaret's door. Perplexed, I walked back up the stone path. In reaching the figure once again, I examined it. It was still, just as it was in my house before springing to life. Keep in mind I treaded lightly. I reached around the figure slowly to knock on the door, but I was stopped. 
the figure came to life again and grabbed my arm with its skeletal hand. I tried to run, but it had such a grip on me that I could not move. Not only this, but I could feel its presence anchoring me to the ground. I can't explain it. But even without its hand, this thing had its hooks in me. I cowered before the figure, and it leaned over me, almost as if to say, leave this place. It then vanished into thin air, right before my eyes. I gained some composure, ran into my car, and quickly left Margaret's house. I spent the whole ride home thinking about what had happened. It would seem as though the piano would not let me return to Margaret's house. I was its owner, and that is the way it would stay until I gifted it to someone else. The only issue with this theory is that I could not do that to someone, even a complete stranger. The problem was mine to deal with, and mine alone. I would have to discover a different method to ease my woes. I arrived home shortly thereafter, and reluctantly opened the front door to my house. Everything appeared normal for the moment. I took advantage of this, and headed back up to my room. I locked the door behind me, not that it would help, and threw myself into a mess of blankets and pillows that was my bed, and the song started up again. I continued to lie down, sick of the repetition. I felt the house shake, but I remained unmoved. It wasn't until a bang at my bedroom door that I started fearing for my life again. It started off quiet, but soon grew louder. I jumped out of bed and started pushing my dresser towards the door. A blockade was the only solution I could come up with, and after placing the dresser in front of the door, I rushed back to bed. Inspecting the door while the bagging continued, I realised that both the door and the dresser were moving. It was slight but noticeable, and before I knew it, the dresser toppled over onto the floor, spilling its contents as it did. Safety was too much to ask for, it seemed. I covered myself in a blanket, attempting to tune out the ruckus around me. The banging persisted, but I chose to focus instead on the song. For the first time, I allowed myself to properly listen to it. Upon doing so, I was pleasantly surprised. It was beautiful. Dark and sullen, but beautiful. The clash of ivory keys coupled with the storming melody soothed me. It soothed me to the point that I could no longer hear the banging at my door or feel the shaking of my house. It's almost weird to say, but I was at peace. Relax, I drifted away with the song, seamlessly entering a state of sleep. While in the musical slumber, I dreamt. The dream world I found myself in was different from that of my usual dreamscapes. It was intensely vivid and ambient. Words like surreal and otherworldly just don't cut it. The awareness I had is also difficult to explicate. Lucidity is too small a concept. This feeling required more explanation than that. I was completely aware of my surroundings, in the sense that I could feel everything about it. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. Relying on sight to truly understand where I was, I became aware of the fact that I was in a forest. It was very dense, but I could make out a clearing up ahead. Instead of walking to it, I felt myself floating towards. Knowing it was a dream, I neither questioned nor tried to fight it. I found that fighting narratives and dreams usually led to an early awakening, and I did not want to wake up to find the dark figure looming over my bed or anything like that. I eventually reached the clearing, 
it was some sort of meadow. In its centre was a tree, a very large tree, a red tree. All at once I knew where I was, I could feel it too. This was the blood tree. This was the precursor to my piano, the building blocks of a haunting in the form of a plant. Just as I took in the sight of the tree, a person stepped out from behind it. He walked over to me as I watched. It was a Native American. I'd never seen one in real life, but I could still tell. He didn't look exactly like the ones portrayed in documentaries, but he wasn't all that dissimilar either. He was most certainly a Native American. I was sure of it. He didn't speak. He simply pointed to the tree. That is where the piano began leaking into my dreams. I could hear the song playing from downstairs as glowing lines ran up and down the tree. It was amazing, for lack of a better word. The Native American then walked back over to the tree and put his hands on it. He motioned for me to do the same. Confused and awestruck, I went over and obliged. In placing my hands on the blood tree, I felt its bark. It was remarkably lifelike feeling, especially considering that I was in a dream. I also felt the glowing lines racing past my skin. It was an incredible sensation. I looked over at my new friend and noticed that his eyes were closed. He was in some sort of trance. Bewildered, I decided I should do the same. And so I did. With my eyes shut, I was greeted by visions. Visions of the tree's early life and purpose. They were visions of sight as well as emotion. I could feel everything that these people felt as they worshipped this ancient plant. It was breathtaking. The tree wasn't always red. It used to be a normal colour. The red is none other than blood. But there weren't any sacrifices made there. Nothing like that. Willing Native Americans came up to the tree every year, sliced their hands open, and placed them on the tree. Their blood then dripped down its exterior. The glowing lines must have been the blood of each individual. Lifelines, if you will. These people were celebrating life and trying to become one with nature. This tree was the anchor that kept their community together, that kept their family from falling apart. This is where they would play music, laugh, dance, and enjoy each other's company. This is where they enjoyed life. They were free from judgement and the worries of day-to-day -day stress. They were at peace in this one spot, at this one tree. My visions eventually led me to the burying of their dead. This too was done at the tree. Every native in this group was buried under the blood tree. One of the elders would then play a song on a small ocarina-like instrument. I recognised it right away. It was the song the piano had been playing every night. It was their song of death. Abruptly, I snapped out of the trance, and I found myself back at the tree. My friend was now sitting on the ground next to me, back against the bark. He had the instrument from my vision in his hand, and he began playing the song of death. I listened intently, but he would not finish. Instead, he handed it to me, motioning for me to play. I hesitantly accepted the invitation. I managed to get the hang of the potato-shaped ocarina rather quickly, as it was a simple instrument. As such, I began playing the song. The strangest thing happened when I did. The tree began wilting. Its bark changed from red to black, as its leaves started falling. I stopped playing. But the Native American motioned with his hands for me to keep going, and so I continued. I kept playing the song 
and the tree kept wilting. My friend was ecstatic. Somehow, this is what he wanted, but I didn't know why. You know how something in a dream can be so perplexing? And it isn't until you finally wake up that you truly divulge its meaning? That's what happened here. Before the tree could fully perish, I woke up in my bed at home. I was consumed by an instant revelation. Margaret's grandfather had taken away these people's headstone. More than that, he took away their connection to nature, as well as with one another. The trees and its spirits needed to be put to rest, once and for all. There was only one way to do it. I needed to play the song of their dead on the piano, the whole way through, without interruption. I can't explain how I came to know this. The culmination of emotions I felt in the dream. Joy. Tranquility. Confusion. Sadness. They all seemed to point me in this direction. I know it doesn't make any sense, but to me, it did. I got out of bed shortly after coming to this realisation and walked over to my bedroom door. There was no banging, no song, nothing. The world seemed to be frozen again, a perfect opportunity to venture downstairs to the piano. I opened the door and walked at normal pace to my destination, so as not to disrupt anything or break the illusion, so to speak. I calmly made my way to the piano and sat down. I placed my hands on the keys and began playing. I knew the song by heart now, having heard it so many times. Not only that, but the piano itself seemed to be guiding my hands across the keys. As I played, the world around me ceased to remain still. The house began shaking violently knocking frames and furniture all over the place. Still, I continued. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the dark figure standing outside of my window. This made me a bit uneasy, but I couldn't stop for anything. I kept playing. I knew not the outcome of this nightly adventure, but I knew that I had an obligation to preserve, if not for the tree or its ghosts, then for myself, I needed this nightmare to end. The dark figure kept disappearing and reappearing at odd locations in the room. Sometimes I'd see it right next to me, other times I could feel it breathing down my neck. I paid it no attention, despite my fear. I wouldn't let it ruin my chance at putting this haunting to rest, not when I'd come so far. Just as the shadowy figure appeared sitting next to me at the piano, and just as I felt the house stop shaking, I hit the final note of the song. How it felt can't be described in words. Cathartic is a good attempt, but no way near as alleviating as it actually felt. It was like a huge weight was lifted, not only off my shoulders, but off the shoulders of many others too. It was an indescribable experience. Basking in elation, I turned my head and noticed that the dark figure was sitting next to me. It didn't look the same, however. The swirling vortex of darkness surrounding it was gone. It now seemed to be nothing more than a cloaked man. He slowly reached up and pulled the hood down from his head, and I watched. It was my friend, the Native American from the dream. But how? Before I could bombard the man with any questions that I may have had, he looked at me and smiled before vanishing. It has been many months since I was haunted by the piano, and I haven't heard a peep out of it since. It's still sitting in my living room, and I do enjoy playing it from time to time. It is my best guess that my theory worked. I somehow had a hand in laying a tree as well as many spirits to rest. The ordeal still begs the question though, who was the cloaked man? 
Was he some form of death who wanted the souls of countless Native Americans put to rest? Or was he a Native American himself? One of the many spirits trying to cross over to the other side. Either way, my perception of the supernatural and paranormal has been completely reversed. How could it not be after what I've been through? I've come to another conclusion as well. For as long as I live, I will never buy another piano off Craigslist ever again. I was homeless for a few years after I turned 18. I was kicked out of my home by my mother because I was a fuck up and I had to live the hard life of being a bum. Being homeless leaves you with a permanent feeling of anxiousness and a sliver of fear buried within you at all times. You expect anything because you always have to be on edge. The main problem I had with being homeless was sleeping. I was getting enough money from working side jobs to not have to worry about food or clothes, but finding a suitable place to sleep was difficult. You always had to keep in mind being detected. Sleeping in the woods was uncomfortable, but the odds of a cop waking you up and trespassing you are slim. I drifted around sleeping in unconventional and uncomfortable areas for quite some time before I discovered an abandoned church off a side road. The church was in pretty good condition, and it was hidden off a side road, so the odds of getting arrested for sleeping there were low. The pews were torn out, and the stained glass windows were murky, with dirt and dust. But there was a roof, and four walls, and it wasn't infested with animals, so it was heaven. I brought a sleeping bag and some blankets, and I slept there for about a week while I was trying to save up money to get an apartment for once. After a week of sleeping there, I came back to the church after a day of working and settled down in my sleeping bag, ready to go to sleep, when I heard the unmistakable sound of a piano. Two keys being hit repeatedly, my pulse instantly skyrocketed and I grabbed the knife I kept on me at all times. I didn't even know there was a piano in the church, so where the fuck was the sound coming from? I slowly got up with the knife in my hand and started packing my things up. I was getting the hell out of there. As I slung my backpack over my shoulder, the sound of the piano cut off and was replaced by the sound of a door creaking open, slowly. I froze again and stared out towards the altar where the sound was coming from. It was dark and I didn't want to turn on the flashlight on my phone. So I stood there breathing heavily while I was willing my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The door behind the altar was swinging open by itself. I tried opening it when I first discovered the church, but it was locked and I didn't want to break it down. The door was swinging open and beyond the door was an even pitcher black than the one I was currently experiencing. I remember I audibly whispered, Fuck and I turned towards the main doors, content on getting out before I saw any more. As I turned, I heard the sound of the door swinging open, be replaced by the sound of it slamming open violently, and suddenly, a plank of wood fell from the rafters in the ceiling and clattered loudly onto the floor, feet away from me. A groan like a mixture of a machine grinding to a halt, and a man in pain, emitted from the door behind me that slammed open and sent literal chills up my spine. I slammed my way out of the church and started running up the road. I looked behind me to see the front door slowly shut by themselves. I never returned. My story may not be the most interesting story you've ever heard. It doesn't end in me seeing a ghost or an alien or anything of that nature, but it is real and I think that's scarier than anything I could imagine. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this 60k special of mine. I've always loved playing the piano and listening to it, much like the mother in the first story. I'd just like to take a moment to give my profound thanks 
to not only my good friend being scared for his incredible narration as always, but to the musicians in the horror community, producing amazing, royalty-free works for us narrators to use in our video. I know this isn't all of them, but in my videos personally, I featured the works of Mew, Coag Music, and Kevin MacLeod, all incredible creators in their own right. Today, please help support those whose work is rarely ever talked about. Go check out their channels and their music, as they really deserve your support, and have a very vast and extensive range of quality music. And who knows, you may even enjoy listening to it in the background from time to time, as I do. Links can be found in the description and on screen now. Thanks for everything guys. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.